Our next speaker is going to uh, talk to us about what you do once they're back in the museum and prepared. So our next speaker is Carrie Levitt Lucian, our Paleontology Collections Manager here at the Natural History Museum of Utah. And talk title is Fantastic Beasts and I Know Where to Find Them. Take it away. Thank you guys so much for coming to my talk. Like Randy said, I'm Carrie Levitt Bouzian, and I am the Paleontology Collections Manager here at the Natural History Museum of Utah. And I have the coolest job ever. I am the librarian, but for fossils, and that is so cool. So I get to work in the coolest room of all time, the Paleontology Collections of the Natural History Museum of Utah, and I am surrounded by fossils. Not just dinosaur fossils, but fossils of all kinds. And so the big fossil, like a big sauropod of femur that you can see here, if you haven't gone down to collections, which is open today until 4.30, you too have an opportunity to get your photo laying down next to this very, this very same femur of a pagosaurus. Photo op, very exciting. This is how paleontologists measure um, the big femur bones from the dinosaurs as they lay down. Usually it's a six foot tall person, but I wanted to do it anyway. Um, so you two can do that. So large fossils and small fossils. I am showing off this dinosaur the fin section that I'm looking at individual bone cells from an animal that lived 150 million years old. So um, it's incredible that I deal with the biggest fossils of all times and literally the microscopic fossils. I also get to work with our amazing paleobotany collection. This fossil is a holotype, which means it's the best of the species ever found, and it is on display downstairs in paleo collection. It is just gorgeous. I also get to work with um, gigantic ammonites the size of car tires, which is so exciting. And we also have this downstairs. And beetles trapped in tar, so everything. It's just so exciting. Um, I never thought I'd actually use my sense of smell as a paleontologist, but every time I open up the cabinet from the La Brea tar pit pits, it just off gases the smell of asphalt. And um, these ones are down there, and you can smell them yourselves. Use your sense of smell in paleontology. So this is the amazing room that I work in. Uh, you guys can see it downstairs on the third floor. Um, my collection, I guess our collection, <laughs> is um, composed of uh, 52,000 catalog specimens. And those are just the catalog ones. We have shelves and shelves and shelves of unprepared stuff. Things are still in the work to be cataloged, and um, that's, that's my job. So uh, 52,000 is a low guesstimate because it hasn't, there's a lot that haven't been processed yet. Um, this includes 35,000 vertebrate fossils. So vertebrates are the animals that have backbones. And so it's not just dinosaurs. There's an exquisite couple of um, crocodiles from the Eocene, which are just so cool. Um, I also deal with invertebrates, about 8,000 invertebrate fossils. This is a spectacular one. Um, these are ammonites, but they've been completely fossilized with pyrites. So it's like fool's gold, so they're shiny. It's like a bonus fossil, which is so exciting. And then paleobotany, uh, again, this is the really cool, this is a holotype, um, it's kind of related to a willow tree, and so it has both a flower preserved and two leaves, and it's just beautiful. I kind of want it as like the wallpaper in my house, it's awesome. <laughs> Um, and then we just got a huge deposit of uh, 2,500 ichnology fossils. So ichnology is the study of tracks and traces. And so we just got it from the geology and geophysics department at the University of Utah, and we're curating those. And what's so cool is something that might not be aware to other people, like kind of maybe a schmear on a rock, is actually like a trackway or a trace from an animal that lived a long time ago. So that's a really, really cool collection. Um, I would talk a little bit about what holotypes are. Holotypes are the first of the species or the best of the species ever described. And I work in this amazing building and we have so many holotypes that are just unique to Utah. And we have, um, um, here we have a couple. We have uh, Cosmoceratops, um, Richard and I up here, which uh, the media called the horniest dinosaur ever. Because that's <laughs> the most ornamentation of any dinosaur ever found. And you can see that down in collections. I found in Grand Staircase, Escalante National Monument. Same thing down here, this is Diablo Ceratops, the devil Ceratopsian, and this is the only one in the world. And that's downstairs, and we can see it too. Um, and uh, we work with uh, Dr. Alan Titus down in uh, the BLM lands of Grand Staircase Escalante National Monument, so to dig those guys up. Um, other ones, this is a, a holotype of a, a fossil fish. So it's just exquisite to have this awesome skull and then all of the scales um, uh, of the front part of the body is still preserved. This animal is called Patriophilus, 
which means father kitty, because it looked like it was a cat, but cats hadn't evolved at that point. Um, but it would have uh, lived in the same ecological niche of a panther in the Eocene about 50 million years ago. So that's in our collection. I was like a saber tooth cat, which is so cool. And this really adorable bacon turtle. Um, it's a turtle, looks like a very happy turtle. Dr. Joshua Lively named it. He's downstairs at the price table, so go say hi. Uh, he thought it looked like a uh, snout of a pig, and so he looked up what the uh, Latin of bacon was and um, named the bacon turtle, which is adorable. Um, but it's so cute. Uh, technical term, by the way. Um, so uh, I get to work with these incredible fossils. Uh, we have about 20 holotypes in our collection right now, and about 20 that are in the process of being made. So like every day there's a new fossil that's important to somebody, whether it's a new species of worm found in our collection, a uh, new species of ceratopsians that are in the work, we have a new species of caiman that Randy's writing up, and it's just incredible to be surrounded by the first, the best of the species um, going to be described. Um, since I'm like the fossil librarian, I am in charge of everything that comes into that room, that collections room, and everything that leaves that room. And so that includes when we go out in the field, like um, Natalie was just talking about, and we bring back these gigantic jackets with dinosaur bones in them, and we are in the loading dock unloading them off of the trailers that uh, the helicopters have dropped um, the bones onto the, the trailers, and they pull up to the museum, and then it's my job to <laughs> get them out of the truck and to get them safely in collections. And so uh, we forklifted them out of the truck and then they were in collections. I forklifted them into collections so that they wait until Tyler's ready and the prep lab um, to take them down and assign them to somebody. Um, and then um, I also am in charge of things that other people collect. So Utah is the state repository for the state of Utah. So other people who have found fossils in Utah, they have to reposit or store them with us. And so not only does our amazing team go out and collect dinosaur bones, but other paleontologists from other places in the world, they dig in Utah and then the fossils come to us. Uh, we have fossils that are coming off of exhibit from our museum uh, for various reasons. We have fossils that are coming off exhibit from other museums from around the world. Fossils that are coming back from loan, so everything is coming into collections. But I'm also in charge of everything that leaves collections, um, like stuff going on exhibit in our museum. So one of the cool things that I get to help with sometimes is making exhibits. So you'll see Tim Lee's talk is next, talking about how we make exhibits. And sometimes I get to work with his amazing team and make exhibits, which is really cool. Both exhibits in our museum, exhibits in other museums. Uh, we have our awesome Traveling Treasures exhibit, which travels the whole state of Utah. Um, and then also, I um, FedEx fossils to France. I don't know if you know that about me, but I actually FedEx fossils to people from all over the world. And um, so we have done 31 loans from nine countries, including Japan, Canada, Switzerland, Germany. Um, I always use FedEx because that's the best. Hopefully they don't drop kick it um, on the way out, because um, some of them are the only ones in the world. Um, but FedEx does have tracking, so that's really important. Um, uh, but yeah, so there's, if people can't come here to do their research, I mail bones to them, which is really cool. So I'm really good at packing up fossils so that they, if they do drop kick them, they will arrive in France safely. So. <laughs> Another cool part of my job that I um, wasn't, didn't know about, but it's totally a bonus, is I work with researchers from all over the world. So the people who can come to the Natural History Museum of Utah to utilize our collections, like the library, uh, which it is, um, I get to meet these awesome people from all over the world. And so, um, and it's, it's so much fun because a fossil that I'm like, well, no one's gonna ever look at that. Like the next day, people are gonna be like, wow, it's a worm that's been fossilized. No one has ever seen that before. Oh my gosh, I'm going to write up about it. And so something that I might have thought might not be the highest priority for somebody is so exciting to somebody else. And so here are some of my recent visiting researchers. I have three more later this week, like it's incredible. So we have uh, one person uh, looking at this awesome crocodilian. Um, this, uh, um, uh, she's looking at the Patrophilus, so she's actually CT scanning Patrophilus, and then some of the phytosaurs that we found here in Utah. Another cool thing that I didn't know was be part of my job is I get to kind of see new pieces of technology before anybody else does. And uh, usually when we think of paleontology, you think of old things, old techniques, the way we plaster things hasn't changed for 150 years, but technology is helping us learn so much about these fossils. 
and that includes CT scanning fossils. I take people, I escort them to the CT scanner places at hospitals to CT scan fossils so we can better understand the intricacies of what they're, what's inside of them. Um, surface scanning is getting really cool. Um, it used to be like this lunar lander that these people were getting packed and then they'd have this arm and then they'd scan it. Now it's like the size of an iron. And so they're up there and they're like scanning them and um, these researchers are actually making like a video game of these things that they can then 3D print and see how, how things would move and it's really cool to be a part of. Um, large scale photography, this is actually our digitization team uh, photographing some of our largest trackways. Um, they're taking large pictures with a really high definition camera that can be zoomed in and zoomed out. Uh, there's also lots of photogrammetry which is taking little pictures of the entire surface and stitching them together so you can see the different animals that walked on the surface. So that's really cool. Um, people who are dealing with footprints, uh, they're doing some really cool technology where they can see how deep the um, tracks would go. Um, here's some um, more surface scanning of Cosmoceratops. Every time I forklift Cosmoceratops down, I have a heart attack because it is such a cool, best one in the entire world. Um, but uh, it's worth it when we get to scan it and then we can like digitally move it around and that's just so cool. Um, everything used to be handwritten um, and we're really trying to move into the digital world. Um, and so this is actually our um, associate registrar, Karen, who is um, doing condition reports for our Antarctic dinosaurs exhibit. And so we have now put our database on an iPad and we've done condition reporting on the iPad. And so there's a lot of people that'll still always handwrite things, but we're trying really hard to get them to use the iPad um, um, so that it can actually be in our system digitally. So um, there's so much that happens in the fossils journey, like you just heard Natalie talk about actually digging up the fossils, but then um, it's not just the beginning of Jurassic Park where they dig up the fossils and then they're magically on exhibit. There's so many things that um, are part of the fossils journey that have to be recorded. And if you ever want to talk about why Jurassic Park is better than Jurassic World, that's another PowerPoint I have, so please <laughs> um, So that, some of the details that have to be recorded are field notes. People are still taking field notes with um, you know, handwriting them. Um, I still do, this is part of my field notes that we have here. So we have to scan and digitize field notes. Um, quarry maps, we draw these amazing pictures uh, marking where the bones are found in case if the orientation shows a river is going from left to right and we can see that because all the bones are lined up that way. Um, and so a quarry maps are really important, but again, those are mostly handwritten that have to be scanned and digitized and linked in the database. Field photos, both old field photos and new field photos. Uh, annual reports, in order to dig in places, we have to get permits that Aunt Natalie was just talking about, and then we have to do annual reports on, well, what did you find and why was it important and why should we give you a permit again? So we have lots of annual reports that we have to record. Preparation sheets, I was just talking about that. Um, mostly they're, they're handwritten, and we have lots of legacy prep sheets, so if you guys want to help transcribe some prep sheets, we have some projects for you. Um, or tell everybody in the prep lab, you know, Karen was saying you should use the iPad. Uh, that would really help me out a lot. Um, and then publication. The whole goal of this whole thing is that science can happen, research can happen with these amazing fossils, and that they can be written up in publications. And these culminating publications should be linked in the database. So again, kind of like the fossil librarian mentality, um, this is what I usually think of when I think of libraries, you know, the old card catalog. And we actually have an old card catalog. This is how specimen number one was written down. Um, and sometimes I use it, sometimes it's easier to get to because you can be like, oh man, what's, what's specimen number two? You know, uh, it's, it's a dire wolf, by the way. Um, but you can lift them up and you can see it. And we gotta scan all those because in addition to having it digitally, having like the person's handwriting, like I can tell people's handwriting and they're like, oh, well, that was my Getty, you definitely know what he was talking about. So having the handwriting is important too. Um, we have really old catalog books that are written in cursive. Um, since nobody teaches cursive anymore, it's a dying art. So um, if any of y'all still know how to use cursive, we could use you guys as transcribers because I had my interns try to do this the other day and they said I can't, don't know how to read cursive. So anyway, that would be really helpful. Thank you so much in advance. There are so many different technologies and old technologies that we have and they all need to be digitized, whether it's microfiche, or film, or um, slides, um, 
all that kind of stuff. Even CDs anymore is kind of old timey, so we have to get all the data from all these technologies into the database, and it's a, it's a lot of work. The goal is to get it uh, digitally. Um, this is what our records look like in the database. So again, when those visiting researchers come to me, the dinosaur librarian, and they say, hey, how many right Allosaurus femora do you have? I can look it up. We're working on getting it available for everybody else so that they can look it up from the comfort of their own labs. And then we can have the pictures of when we found it in the field, the pictures of how it was when it was prepared out, um, that kind of a thing. So this big overarching goal of having it in um, on the web online so people can do this research from their own home. Um, another cool thing I didn't know that I would have to get to do in my job is deal with fossils that have been collected illegally. So a couple years ago, Randy got a phone call from um, law enforcement that said, hey, there's an abandoned storage locker in Salt Lake City full of fossils. Do you want them? And we're like, oh my gosh. And so Randy went, and then he brought a team with him to go see it. And we found these boxes covered in rat poop um, full of fossils. And he determined, yes, these are important to science, and then we he worked on acquiring them and getting them curated into our collections. And that included some awesome fossils, like these ones. We have a lower jaw from an ancient rhinoceros relative, um, some more of these awesome gigantic herbivores, um, turtle specimens, lizard um, vertebrae. So it was really awesome. It was like 2,000 specimens. We were still working on curating them. Um, another interesting find was a bunch of Cambrian fossils illegally collected in Utah, crossed the border into Canada, sold to a Canadian museum, and then Homeland Security got a hold of them and brought them back to Utah, so that was really cool, which is awesome because it includes so many different fossils that we've literally never seen before. The researchers from Harvard that are um, publishing these are literally drooling. They're like, send us more, we need to publish faster, and like, so this is a new species here, which is so exciting. Um, this one's really cool. I'm showing down at um, collections now that's been pyritized, so it's been fossilized with pyrite. So that's a bonus fossil. Um, and thanks to the BLM, it helps with all this stuff because all this stuff is illegally collected in BLM and then transferred to us. Um, specimens that have been collected illegally on field trips, um, that um, geology field trips, unfortunately. And then they're seized and then they're brought to us too to properly curate and store forever. Um, that includes these fossils here too. So um, to echo Natalie, it's the greatest thing to don't pick them up. You're going to be excited, but take a picture of it, something with a scale bar. If you have a GPS or you know how to read a map, just get that information to us, email us, email the Utah Geological Survey. But if you can just leave them there, that's great. Because we have a huge database of everything that's been found in Utah. And so you can be like, oh yeah, we've done that before. You know, Or this is the new find of the century, which has happened from people submitting their, talk, their uh, pictures. So, um, anyway, I have the best job in the entire world. We have a lot of fun in paleo collections. Um, I love being the fossil librarian. I'd love to tell you more about it, but they only gave me 15 minutes. I'm at 19. Um, I'd like to thank these awesome interns that make my life easier. They're all working downstairs, so go tell them Carrie said they did a good job. Brooke, Jenna, Rachel, and Alex. Um, my wonderful team of volunteers who make my life easier and um, do a great job and like do the work to make the science happen um, and these folks too and I did not trap Randy and Philip in the cabinet I promise <laughs> <laughs> and, on. and with that thank you so much for your attention and I'll take any questions if I have any time Specimen? Oh, yeah, so specimen number one and number two are from the La Brea Tar Pits. Um, one of them is a dire wolf, complete skeleton, and one's a smilodon, which is really neat. And then um, uh, invertebrate paleontology number one is um, uh, that big ammonite from the Cretaceous. And then uh, paleobotany specimen number one is that awesome holotype with the, the willow branch and stuff like that. That's a great question. What is the largest fossil that you have FedExed before? <laughs> <laughs> oh man, that's hard. I, I, there was a researcher who wanted all of the Allosaurus right femora that we ever had, um, but he just wanted help to get to South Jordan, and so I literally packed them up in coolers um, and drove them down, because those were the biggest protective boxes I could think of. I think I mailed a cooler to France before, 
before. Um, uh, and now FedEx will help you, but I think I'm better at packing than they are. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. What's one of your favorite um, things in the collection? Oh man, well I have an entire table in collections right now showing off my favorite fossils. Um, my favorite one ever is one that I have down there, so you gotta check it out, is an Allosaurus femur bone, so the upper leg bone, that's been fossilized with amethyst inside. So it's like a bonus fossil, it's a dinosaur bone with a geode inside, it's so cool. Um, and then also Cosmoceratops is awesome, so it's so cool. So come down and see it. Any yeah, other questions? Um, like what's some of like the weirdest stuff you have in collections? Like I saw like the dinosaur poop you have on the table downstairs, but like <laughs> like I'm sure there's like some other like funky stuff that you're like, huh. Oh yeah, absolutely. Um there's um, some lizard skin um, impressions that we have, so they're really tiny, but like I couldn't tell if the lizard was like rolling around in it or if like they molted and then that fossilized. Um, for a while, Randy had like an actual lizard in a box, and he, I swear he would hide it from me, and then like I would like open it and be like, ah, because like I'm not expecting anything with flesh on it, right, because everything's fossilized. Um, I have an entire cabinet uh, that's, uh, um, we have an entire cabinet of um, stuff from the Holocene, so modern stuff, and so like we have a giraffe uh, in our collection, um, and we have the skull and the pelvis, nothing else, and it still has like in on it, and it came from the zoo, and it's like a really weird story about it, and so that's strange. Um, yeah, lots of very strange. Um, I'm also kind of in charge of the mineralogy collection, and the way that they used to store opals is in like a sphere filled with oil. And so it looks like like a magic ball, like they you know, predict things on. So every time I open that, I'm like, ooh. So. <laughs> What's the biggest fossil you've ever mailed to France? Uh, yeah, well, I, I, I think it would have been one of the femur bones. Um, usually when they're really big, it, we want to make sure it's protected the most. Um, the biggest fossil we have downstairs is the scapula coracoid um, from a sauropod. So you'd think it would be the femur, the one the biggest bone in your body from your hip to your knee, but this one is like a scapula coracoid and it is like seven feet long. Um, I will never mail that to France, that would be very expensive, <laughs> but it is a really, really big fossil that we have. Have you ever lost um, a lot of information on a specimen because it's handwritten and you can't read it? Yeah. Well, that's a good question. We've lost things when people don't take notes in the field. Uh, we've lost things when, when, um, when people have lost their field notebooks, which has happened before. Um, uh, so taking notes is really important, <laughs> scanning them kind of a thing. Um, we, with, during the pandemic, we have a, a digitization crew led by Allison Wilkins, and she um, did a whole digitization project because we were all working from home and, and itching to do something useful. And so she scanned a bunch of the documents that we couldn't read or other people couldn't read um, and put them on the Atlas of um, Living Australia. And uh, so people all around the world who can read cursive um, who, di who digitize it for us. And so we still have a couple of projects like that. So um, that's a great question. So when you need to have something like CT scanned, um, how do you get time? And do you, like, do you need to go to a hospital or are there research like CT scanners? Because I would imagine, and then also, like, who the heck pays for that? Because that can't be cheap. <laughs> That's a great question. So um, we, uh, so there's a couple of paleontology labs in the world, like AUT Austin, who's lucky enough to be right next to a CT scanner lab, so they just do it all the time for fun. Um, we at the Natural History Museum of Utah have a, an arrangement with the South Jordan Medical Center, so that's where we take all of our fossils. It's really funny because um, they always want to do it on a calm day. We, they book out time, but knowing that an emergency can happen at any time. And Tyler wrote this all the prep by manager and myself were there one time, CT scanning an ichthyosaur skull. And we were all had it laid on the table, and we were like, oh my gosh, there's an emergency. You need to hide in the closet. We're like, okay. And so we put the skull onto the gurney, and we like threw it went in the closet, and we were just there while they were CT scanning. <laughs> and then they're like, okay, paleontologist, you can come out now. And we're like, 
So that's fun. Um, sometimes they're just super excited and um, we uh, give them tickets to our museum and behind the scenes things. So sometimes it's, sometimes it's free, but sometimes it's not free. So um, it depends on fans and stuff like that and how charming you are. <laughs> yeah. Have you ever lost a bone? And if so, what's the procedure? Uh, yeah, that's, that's, so my worst nightmare is when people come and um, say, oh, I really want to look at this fossil, this fossil, this fossil, and then I can't find it. Um, that's hard. Um, I, I try to get it all in the database. I try to know where everything is, but sometimes I can't find it. Sometimes it has never been returned on loan, and like the person died, and it's like in their closet. Um, so that they don't feel like that's my fault. Um, but um, so sometimes we've lost fossils. We've mailed things to people, and we've done condition reports saying you know exactly what it looks like, and then it gets mailed back, and half of it's missing, and we have to be like, hey. Where's the other end of the Stegosaurus spike? And they're like, never got it! So that's a hard game to play. Good question. All right. Well, thank you so much for your time today. Thank you.